there is no other outcome to this other than appeasing the mob and this and this innocent police officer who just did his job and did his job textbook. By the way, he's described all his peers as a textbook police mm -hmm. officer, a by the book police officer, which is ironic because he did exactly what you showed him. He to do. did it by the book. <laughs> he did. The, uh, he literally did the illustration on the book. No comment. <laughs> no, he didn't kill the Probably blame me for being an idiot, but and which you were, which we all were. <laughs> you have to make it to where crime doesn't pay. You have to deter crime, whether it's crime or terrorism. It's the same principle. You have to clash with supervision. You have to, or nothing will get done. Supervisors can't learn how to supervise, and you can't learn how to respect a supervisor without confrontation. It has to happen. Do not take that out. JV team for life. What's up, everybody? Just want to give a quick shout out to Zero Nine Holsters, ruggedized equipment, proudly made in America for cops by cops. This Ohio based company uses injected molded plastics and Codex Thermoform material, which makes it super easy to clean all those fluids that you get all over your uniform every shift. They have radio holsters, BWC holsters, mag holders for pistol and AR, pepper spray holsters, handcuff holsters, flashlight and various canine equipment holsters. Ruggedized cases allow for a quick draw and return to holster rather than a shapeless case where you have to look around and fumble. You can go to 09holsters.com to find shops near you that sell 09, or you can head over to their shop online and use promo code ANTIHEROZ910 for 10% off your order. That's ANTIHEROZ910 for 10% off your order. Go show them some love. And it's that time of year. It's time for Street Cop Training Conference 2024. It's going to be April 28th through May 3rd in Orlando. Technically Kissimmee, but Orlando, Florida. Come catch classes from all the greats, all the motivational speakers. FRCC, Refracted Wolf Apparel will be there. Antihero will be there. Come say hi. Tickets are cheap as f for f five days, essentially. We get there Sunday night cocktail hour we drink and then monday night we drink tuesday night we drink wednesday night and thursday night and friday night we drink but it's a good time the amount of education you're going to get there is insane and it's done by street cops so head on over to streetcoptraining.com and register now and get your ticket are we ashing into the cans oh you gotta act what am i doing come on now. what am i doing come on now <laughs> It's not my first rodeo, but it is my first rodeo in here. Yes, this is true. <laughs> Welcome back to the Anti-Hero Podcast, part Delta Force, part Street Cop, all podcasts. I'm Tyler, owner of Refracted Wolf Apparel. Use promo code Anti-Hero for 15% off the best graphic tees and outsider culture with team room flags, stickers, hats, and Ranger panties. And I am Brent Tucker. Owner of First Responders Coffee and Cigar Company, world's greatest cigars and world's best coffee. Go to frccoffee.com or frccigars.com. Use FRCC15 to get 15% off. And thank you so much for listening, guys. It's weird. We don't have to scream anymore. No. No, we don't have to scream anymore. <laughs> We're in our new location with... Uh... Inside the, what are we calling it? The Running for Heroes studio? The Running for you Heroes to, podcast studio. You want to explain how yeah. you guys, what, what you, you guys teamed up in a studio together. Yeah, no, well, we teamed up in a warehouse together. Yeah, that's what um, I meant, sorry. And uh, part, as, as we figured out what that deal should look like and what we need to partner up with them. And um, the, the warehouse size is great. I said, but uh, they asked me if I needed an office. I said, no, I don't, but I do need a podcast studio. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, we turned the, the office they were, they were willing to, to give me into this podcast studio. It is not done. It is, there's no door on it and the walls aren't painted. Um, but by, uh, by, by the next video, it should be all done up and, and looking good and maybe not as echoey. I don't know how it's going to turn out in the, in the mics, but, but here we go. Yeah. Hopefully Diogo, our audio guy can work some magic cause it's really echoey in here. I was going to try to do it like this. Maybe we can hear it, but... Um, so we're just coming off our uh, episode with Eric Deming, the retired SEAL, yep. and that, uh, of course, we knew that was going to be... 
controversial. Controversial. Although it shouldn't be. There's nothing controversial about the truth. I, the, the same thing about this episode, and which is George Floyd, as you guys will already know by the by the title. There's nothing controversial about it. The truth is just the truth. Just because it's controversial to you and you don't like hearing the truth doesn't make it controversial. Yeah. So real quick, before we jump into George Floyd and the fall of Minneapolis, which we, I'm not going to lie, I use the fall of Minneapolis documentary on YouTube, which was great, but it's, it's being shadow banned and hidden to where um, you have to search in the fall of Minneapolis completely in order for it to pop up and they can't run as, you know. I watched that one too. It was a good one. It, it, of of the ones I watched, that was I think that was probably the best one. I would highly suggest you guys uh go watch that. Um it's um it'll it'll make you mad. I I'll say this. And uh I I I'm no different than anyone else. I, I get emotional reactions off of things I don't know. Um I usually give cops a bit of the doubt right off the bat and say, hold, hold, hold on. Let's, let's wait for, let's, let's wait. Um, and on this one, even I said, well, it's really, it's pretty bad. Really nothing you can do. I mean, we got, he's, he's got his knee on the guy's neck for eight minutes and the guy dies. Um, and then I get the digging in on this. That's actually not the truth. Yep. That's, I, that is not the truth. Spoiler alert. <laughs> You, you still need to watch the rest of it, and I'll tell you how that's not the truth, but that is factually untrue. So, before we get into that, the Instagram inbox, we get a lot of messages. Um, if we have ever not replied to you, we read them all, but the problem is is that I'll go in and check, and I'll see, like, oh, there's 10 or 15 messages, and I'll go, I'll go read them all. Some of them are specifically for Brent. I can't go as far as I know on Instagram and mark it unread. So it stays red. I have to convey with Brent that, Hey, there's a message in there. We do have a media company that's offered to run our Instagram, but we try to like to do it ourselves. Yeah. Um, Brent has to then remember to do it and then go in there and find the message that has now 10 more new unread right. messages on it. Yeah. If you could. So we, I'm going to try and sell you the Patreon, but if you don't feel like spending a cup of coffee a month on a Patreon, uh, just put this is to Brent or this is to Tyler. And then I, I way I know if I see something that says to Brent, I won't open it. And then if he says sees to Tyler, even though I think you're cool with me, I think everybody wants to talk to you. (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) The, uh, or if, if we forget to respond to you, send, send another message. Put it back up to the top, and we're not ignoring you. I no yeah. matter how offensive your message is, uh, pe- pe- I've replied to uh, all. You can all start can. it with Brent is a giant piece of shit, like somebody did, today. and I'll still respond to you. <laughs> yeah, and you were cordial. You were professional. I was way nicer to him than he was to me. Oh, I was gonna light that dude okay. up, man. That's okay. Uh, that's that's why uh, we we. The subjects we cover, we knew not everyone was going to be happy about hearing the truth. And so we it's, it's no surprise to us. And that guy was definitely, a, I almost joined the military guy, 100%. <laughs> so yeah. um, for the Patreon, it, if you if you decide to describe to the Patreon, it, it gives us automatic access. It sends us alerts when somebody messages it. So we can stay in touch. I don't have my notifications on Instagram turned on. I don't know if you do. So I, I do, but I'm not always on that yeah. account. I'm on the FRCC account, mm. so I don't see it. Yeah, I have two pages to run. You have a page to run, and then we have our podcast page to run. So, um, but the Patreon, we have to do a drawing. We haven't done a drawing okay. this month for some free, and uh, this will be for refracted wolf apparel swag. So, I put in all of the straight hooligan five dollar members into this is a option. This is a benefit of being a five dollar member is that we're going to do a raffle. So we're going to do a raffle for Refracted Wolf of Pearl merch. So I'm going to hit start raffle and I'm going to have, we're going to use an app and I put everybody's name in it and I'm going to have Brent read it off. All right. And it's really dramatic. So we'll probably have to. (laughs) Very dramatic. Oh, it is. It's going through all the names. Oh yeah. I think it goes to it like three times. Here it goes. It's like the price is right. Yeah. Tick, tick, tick. 
Oh, it was almost Liz Pittman, but it is Dustin. It almost stopped. She was almost a back-to-back winner. Oh, Dustin, of course. I put Dustin because he didn't put a last name. So we'll reach out to you on Patreon. But if you see this, reach out to us first if uh, if you get a chance. And uh, we'll find out who you are. But hit us up. We need your Addy. Send you some free merch. That being said, the most polarizing topic in law enforcement. Well, it's not polarizing for law enforcement. It's For the it, country. Yes, it's polarizing because, like you said, Brent, every single person, whether they're 10 years old or 80 year old, will weigh in on George Floyd. They know his name. Yeah. We, we, I, I asked you, and I actually forgot it. I was like, uh, you know, maybe the second biggest name is the hands up, don't shoot guy. And I was like, what's his name? Yeah. And I was like, it's something brown. And then it took us for a second. Yeah. Like, oh, Michael Brown. Uh, there's there's none of that with uh, with this scenario. Everybody knows George Floyd's name, and they think they know the story. So they don't. And and I remember when this happened. Uh, you know, um, it it was disgusting to me in a couple ways. Now I know I didn't know what happened because I assume I don't know what happened. Uh, just like everything that comes out, and everybody wants to put their opinion on it. I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. But what I did see, which didn't surprise me at all, was the politicians immediately weighing in and using it because it was an election year. What also didn't surprise me, but it was sickening, is seeing every single chief and sheriff across the country put in how disgusting that was. And do because it was it's mob mentality, it's following mindset. They all saw other chiefs do it. We got to put something out on Facebook right now saying how disgusting it is and how they don't reflect law enforcement. Starting the demonization process. There's nothing wrong with saying oh that looked bad i wouldn't condone it. i wish leadership still wouldn't say that but there's a difference between saying oh that looked bad but we're gonna wait then immediately demonizing what happened well, and and we'll get into it uh we're not there yet but as we know we had answers within 12 hours within 12 hours yeah they couldn't even wait that long we we we, we knew uh something was amiss here with with this story and, you know, we had law enforcement uh, influencers weighing in on it. You know, I got so sick of it. I started reaching out to them and saying, like, you know, stop doing that. Stop. You know, and, and the funny thing is, is like, I've uh, I know some of you guys have put knees on necks before. And you're the one sitting here saying how disgusting and absolutely atrocious that is. It's like, well, you know. It's because it's putting a knee on somebody's upper neck right here doesn't do anything to them. I'm not seeing it a lot, but you know now you you go near somebody's neck and yeah, and we'll and again we'll and we'll we'll talk about that <laughs> when we get to it. There's, there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm and to be honest with you, I, I'm every time every time we do this, every time we look into something, uh, I learn a lot, um, and it uh, I've. I, I was when you said you wanted to do this episode. I was I I, I was excited about it because I knew I'd learn something. And to be honest with you, I didn't. I this 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 um even though I learned more, I told you my my initial reaction, be like, oh, that's really bad. Even I learned a lot more about what I thought I knew about this. Is what always happens. So I'm I'm excited for you guys to hear this and share these findings with you, so you guys can get caught back up and get back into uh, Facebook wars with your friends on, on the anniversary of, of George, of George Floyd. Uh, and the first thing we'll talk about, you know, how we kick this thing off is, um, so obviously everyone knows who George Floyd is. Um, let me tell you what most people in society say most people that's generalizing. Let's say what some of our most influential people have said about George Floyd. Um, I'll start off with our current commander in chief. If we if we know who our current commander in chief is, does he know? Does he know? Does he know? Um, he said George Floyd has unified people of every race and generation in peace and with purpose. I don't know where he got that from. I don't know where he believes. Uh, that they have unified in peace. I don't think the officers of the third precinct would say they he's unified everyone in peace. We'll get to the third precinct here in a second. Um, let's talk about his predecessor, Barack Ooh. Obama. Do you, do you know what Joe Biden compared 
said that George Floyd had more of an impact on society than Martin Luther King's assassination. George Floyd's death had more of an impact on society than Martin Luther King's assassination. It came out of the president's mouth. I, I, I can't even start on that. I'm just, just going to shake my head and keep reading. That's it's Barack Obama said, we can't be treated differently because of our race, whether it's health care, interacting with police or just bird watching. Now, maybe there's a story out there he's referring to. I don't know of a lot of black people who can't go bird watching because of their race. Um, I I only have so much time to Google and go down all these rabbit trails. Um, but it seems like he's putting a massive swath out there. I'm not sure that. So if they're getting treated differently in healthcare, are nurses and doctors racist as well? I mean, what a, what a yeah. polarizing statement to, to say at that time. And then to say that he was treated differently just because of the color of his skin by, by police, you will think differently. By the time we're done with this podcast, it had nothing to do with his race. Um, Oprah said that he was a gentle giant. Um, I think we can ask Miss Henriquez that he put a gun in her stomach and him and his hooligan friends robbed her blind while there was a one-year-old in the house. I don't believe she would describe George Floyd as a gentle giant. Um, and then besides, you know, we could go for days about uh, people rebranding this guy as a saint. Um, Newark, New Jersey has put a 700-pound bronze statue of this man in their city. So if we stopped there and I said, based off of this, who is George Floyd? You'd say, an amazing man. Amazing man must have been. He's our our generation is Gandhi. Who is this amazing man? What are you gonna tell us? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'm I'm glad you asked who this amazing man was. So, in 1997, this amazing man, this gentle giant, was convicted of uh, delivery of cocaine charges. I'm going to read this real fast, or else this will be a two-hour podcast. In 1998, aggravated robbery, use and exhibit a deadly weapon. 1998 again, theft. 2001, failure to identify the police officers. 2002, possession of cocaine. 2002, criminal trespass. 2004, delivery of cocaine. 2005, possession of cocaine with intent to deliver. 2008, aggravated robbery of a firearm. Uh, and this was the case where him and five of his friends pretended to be a plumber and stormed Miss Enrique's house with another woman in there and a one-year-old. And George Floyd sat there and watched as one of those thugs pistol-whipped miss enriquez um and to the point where she ended up being hospitalized such a gentle giant in 2019 narcotics violation was with large amounts of oxycodone pills and as all of you know in 2020 he would have been charged with fraud or forgery so that's who this amazing man is and of course they may say Hey, uh, uh, all of that is great, but in the, the day, it doesn't matter what you did. That that doesn't mean a police officer can kill you, and, th and that's what's going to be their argument. What say you to that? Well, I don't want to jump too far into it, but I mean, I, it it just seems like every time we talk about a case like this, we're not allowed to use someone's background. You know, well, you always said it too to me. You know. How did this even happen? How did you encounter the police? Let's talk about how you ended up in an encounter with law enforcement before we even talk about what happened. So, Because according to former President Barack Obama, you're treated differently just because the color of his skin, which puts out this narrative that, hey, 
George Floyd could have just been walking around while black, and this is caused in an encounter with the police. His arresting officer out of the four was a black officer. <laughs> and the other one was a Chinese officer. Yep. The other two were white. It's... Eh. It's uh, they they paint they they do a good job of of of, uh, of painting a narrative, don't they? So you're going to take us through the first, not the first arrest, but the arrest prior to the 2020 incident. Yes. Right. Uh, so just like you said, I mean, what what caused you to get in this interaction in the first place? Just like the the Waco event, I I like to dig back in the history a little bit, and really understand how how we got here, and really glad I did. Because that 2019 arrest, which was the very last encounter with police before his 2021, and there's body warm camera to this, really paints a picture. I get you have to watch them both to understand who George Floyd is and and this interaction. So in 2019, he uh, is pulled over and gets into a um, an encounter with Officer Scott Crichton of the Minnesota Police Department. And and this, it is so eerily similar to the 2020 to the 2020 police cam video. And I'll and I'll before I saw this 2019 one, I'll be honest. I saw the 2020 video. I was like, man, this guy's really compliant. He's really nice. He's kind of you know, it George seems. Floyd? Yeah, yeah. He's saying, "Sir, he's like he's he's always saying, hey, 'Hey, I'm not like that.' Although he's resisting, yeah, he's doing it in the nicest fashion. And I'm like, well, maybe he's just a little slow. Maybe you should give this guy a little more, a little more credit. And well, it's also because I'm not a police officer and I don't have the experience to know when when someone's not showing you their right hand when you ask seven times, he might be doing something with that right hand. What what could be happening? I'm glad you asked, Internet. Repeated requests to place both hands on the steering wheel so the officer can see them. He's being very nice, but he's continuing to hide his right hand. Repeated requests to open his mouth and spit out what he has in it. This is the first 2019. This is the first 2019. Yeah. Um, he, he gets very emotional, starts talking about how he lost his mom. In 2019, which he lost his mom in 2018. Yep. I, uh, I'm not saying that there is a definitive time frame that you can stop mourning over your mom, but his mom had died 12 months ago. And if you'd have watched that video, you'd have thought his mom died that morning or yesterday. He, she died the year before. He pleads with the officer, don't shoot me. Please don't shoot me. Please don't shoot me. The officer tells him repeatedly. I'm not going to shoot you. I have no intention of shooting you over and over. I'm not going to, he's pleading, you know, for his life when the officer was very cordial with him. Never. Um, the, uh, tells finally, this is what saved his life in 2019. Cause he did, uh, ingest a large amount what? of drugs. No way. He did. And then he tells officers that he had ingested several tablets of Percocet. Uh, which is described as a strong narcotic, and was promptly taken to the hospital. They took his blood, his blood pressure on scene, and his blood pressure was 216 over 160. And let me tell you what your blood pressure has to be to put you into a hypertensive crisis. 180 over 120. That's we'll, bad. We'll That's bad. You. So he is, he is way, way, uh, he, he's in the red. We say he's in the red. He also uses uppers and downers at the same time. He has, not to jump too far ahead, but during his uh, autopsy, he had methamphetamine and fentanyl in his system. And uppers and downers, or any drugs, is going to be hard on the system for a healthy man. And again, not going to get too far ahead, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and say something you guys may have already figured out. He was not a healthy man. So the difference between 2019 and 2020 at the end of the day is he was honest about ingesting drugs and that's what saved his life. Yep. Let's move up to 2020. Multiple requests to see his hands. They see his left hand refuses to show his right hand. 
you can you can uh, stop the body worn cam of the of the officer, and as he's opening his mouth to 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 plead, "Don't shoot me," he has you can see the pills in his mouth. So the pills are in his mouth, and that's we know the pills are in his mouth later on anyway. But that's, yeah. So he's doing the same thing he did in 2019 and 2020. He's starting to ingest drugs immediately. Claims to have been shot last time by police and that he's fearful for his life. Well, we just went over the last time that uh, he was he was with police and he was he was not shot. He was actually taken to the hospital. He was t- and, and his- they saved his life. Yeah, that's right. And they saved his life. A lot of people, you know, like these evil cops out there. You know, the war, our, the first thing we're trained in is, you know, do you need medical help? That's going to trump. Your charges aren't going to go away. You know, a lot of people try to take the ambulance ride thinking they're going to be the jail cell. But, I mean, eventually, if the hospitals either are going to clear you or admit you. If they clear you, you're going straight to the jail. If they admit you, the jail is going to send people to sit there and watch you until you're discharged. Which is so fun you say that. And a lot of people are going to think, well, that's what they should have done. They, you're about to find out as you're to this point, you're finding out they've done everything right. They did everything right. And we'll tell you everything they did. Um, he also claims to have just lost his mom in 2020, knowing she had died several years earlier at this point. So it's almost like he has a playbook. Don't shoot me. Uh, say things, you know, to, to really kind of be polite with the officer, then kind of be scared. Talk about his mom, anything while he's trying to relocate or dispose of drugs in, in the meantime. Yeah, because they say the things, and guess what the new thing, they, after this incident, guess what the new thing people started saying? I can't breathe. Oh, yeah, and so that's- <laughs> he was asked to step out of the vehicle eight times before they finally uh, got him out of the vehicle. Now, there's two other people in the vehicle with him, uh, two upstanding citizens. One is uh, Shawanda Hill, who's in the back seat, who's pleading with George mm-hmm. to stop resisting. He's doing it in the nicest way, but he's absolutely not being compliant whatsoever to, to the point where the lady in the back seat's like, stop, George, just just do what they say. She, she's now pleading with him. The other guy uh, beside him, upstanding citizen um, named Maurice Hall, who has legal problems of his own. Mm-hmm. Open we'll, cases. Uh, yeah. yeah, we'll talk about him in a second as well. So that's... Um, the officer, So as she's pleading with him to stop resisting, the officers are also pleading with him to stop resisting. Officers move him off the street because when they finally get out of the vehicle, he starts like faking falling down. He's just flailing. He's doing everything to make the officer's job difficult. While oddly enough, at the same time, being kind of nice about it and saying, sir, he says, I'm not that guy. You know, he's 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 overly emotional. He's almost a basket case, you know, of emotion. So he's not I'll tell you what, he's, he's not your normal aggressive resistor. And then he says. The thing that makes it all make sense is I'm I don't want to go back. And he says that he goes I don't want to go and it's back. Like, oh, that's Absolutely. why we're getting this yep. show. Absolutely. Um, the, and the officers move him off the street for his own safety. So they move him out of an SUV, which I think is going to be very important to know that he was in an SUV before this. And they move him off the street to the sidewalk. Um. Why is that the sidewalk? The uh, he asks them, "Hey, is everything all right?" Um, because it looks like you're on something. Is specifically what? So the officers actually identify like pretty early on. He says you're acting kind of you're fidgety or strange. Because yep, you. Uh, it looks like you're on something. You're acting erratic. Is is the is the uh, the words the police use? And the police even says at one point, um, "Is that foam coming? It looks like you're foaming at the mouth." And then he says, yeah, I was playing basketball earlier. I was hooping earlier today. So there's, there's indicators, and the cops are, are, are noticing that. And oddly enough, cops are actually pretty good at their job. They, they're starting to uh, you know, play, some, play some things together. So at this point, they tell, they tell George Floyd, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're just going to place you in the back of the car, 
and we have to figure this out. And he's like, I don't even know what I'm here for. They're like, well, you gave a fake $5 bill to, to this store and they're not real happy about it. And he even says, and we're just going to figure this out. Yeah. A hundred percent. A fake five dollar bill to the store. First off, there's tons of things. I don't know uh, Minnesota's statutes, but I know for a fact there's a lot of things you got to prove. You got to prove intent. That's right. So oh, right. even on scene, there might not even have been a physical arrest. There might have been tra- files charged later after an investigation. But George Floyd could have said, "I didn't know it was a e- fake." Exactly, and it would have been done. On top of that, one of the things that cops do a lot is we do. We just dis- dissolve, what do you call that? Not dissolve situations, but resolve situations. And you go to that store clerk and go, you got your product back, or you never got the product. You want him right. trespass from here so he never comes back again. The store clerk's yep. not going to want to go to court and go through a whole legal process over a fake five. Yep. They're going to be like, trespass him, I don't want him back here again. George Floyd would have driven away on his merry happy way with the drugs in his mouth or in his hand or wherever they were. And what's crazier is he says, I don't want to go back. To me, by say, knowing that he's about to go to jail, he says, I don't want to go back before they even bring up the fr- the, the the forgery, um, the the fake bills. So he knows. He, so he knows it was fake. But you're right. By the day he could have continued to say it wasn't. Prob- I'm sure they have bigger things to do mm-hmm. than put throw a guy in jail over a $5 bill. The guy ended up losing his life over... A fake five dollar bill that he knew was fake and decided to play this game with cops rather than either just owning up to it or there's, or just paying for it. There's a high chance that George Floyd would have driven home that day and overdosed in his own home from the amount of drugs in his system. Well, that that, that is absolutely correct because he's already ingested the drugs at this point. Yeah. I've, and the, the, we'll get to the toxology report. The toxology report is going to show that he was, he was going to die at this point regardless of uh Yeah, because he had drugs in his system that he took, like how he would take drugs, and then he also ate the drugs that he hadn't taken yet. That, that's right. <laughs> So, and, and we'll get to that. Let me uh, keep moving on this. Um, the uh, moves to the sidewalk. Um, and then, and for, so after they put him on the sidewalk, they said, we're going to put you in the back of this vehicle and we're just going to figure it out. So they move him across the street to the, to the police SUV. At this point, uh, he starts saying, I'm claustrophobic. I can't go in there. I'm claustrophobic. And I'll tell you how that's crazy. He just moved from one SUV, and he's getting put into another SUV. Mm-hmm. That your, your claustrophobic wasn't really kicking in the last SUV you were just in, but now you have claustrophobic that's so detrimental that uh, you can't stand to be inside an SUV that Makes you a lot were of just sense. in. <laughs> and the cops are actually being pretty nice to him at this point. The cop even says, hey, I'll turn on the air condition and I will roll down the window. Yep. And I was like, man, these guys are actually being he's doing, pretty nice. He's That's doing a, the classic, classic cause the scene. Cla- classic cause the scene. I think, I think sometimes they think that they are going to toddler their way, temper tantrum their way out of an arrest. <laughs> like the cops are going to go, you know what? This just isn't worth it. <laughs> I I don't think I've seen that yet. Not uh, yet. Have, have, uh, have you? Has anyone ever tantrumed their way out of a, out of an arrest for you? They try the hospital thing a lot, yeah. they, and sometimes okay. you do have to go. Man, is this charge worth going and sitting at the hospital for four hours? Because they'll do it. They'll they'll play that card first. Yeah, and then you got to stick to your guns and go. All right, we'll go to the hospital. Well, what's crazy is Shawanda Hill, who was with him, has already pleaded with him. Hey, basically, this isn't worth it. Stop resisting. Well, she's not the only one. There's another black man that's a bystander watching this go down as he's starting to fall again, scream, say, I can't breathe. He starts saying, I can't breathe at this point, and he's not even in the vehicle yet. So he starts the I can't breathe there. And then uh, as they're trying to put him in the vehicle, he says he's claustrophobic, that he can't breathe. And then he starts saying things about COVID. It's going to give me my COVID's going to flare up. He is just reaching anything and 
everything not to be put in the back of this vehicle. So much, when they actually get him in the vehicle, instead of falling onto the seat, he rolls over to the footwell. Now, someone who's claustrophobic, that would have been the last thing they would have. That, that's the most, that's the tightest place, that whole thing. Damn. And when he rolls down there, does he, does, he, does he start getting in some sort of, you know, talking about, I, I can't breathe because this, is, this close space is too much for me. I told you I was claustrophobic. No. He he starts he 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 changes he changes his narrative and he doesn't even talk about being claustrophobic, in the place where he should be the most claustrophobic. Hell, you put me in a foot well for yeah a little bit. Uh, I I won't like that. But he doesn't say it there. Um, the the black bystander actually says, "Hey man, stop it! You're going to give yourself a heart attack." Yeah. How crazy is that? So everyone watching this scene, so far. No one is anti-cop right now. In fact, most people watching this, it's fairly safe to say, are pretty anti-George Floyd of the circus that he's making over this. Yeah, well, because some of these, you know, in these cities, there's a lot of OGs. There's a lot of guys that don't play the game, that, that toddler game. And, you know, they're, they're advocates of, you got me, let's go. Let's go. Let's get this over with. I'm not going to sit here and cry about it. I broke the law. You got me. Or, you know, so... The, but the tantrum in the patrol car, that's such a common thing. You have four or five cops, which is actually makes it safer for the person being secured, but it looks bad. So people think five cops beating up on one guy. It's actually five cops able to use a lot more technical restraints, uh, not having to exert themselves 100%, and they're yeah. able to restrain them safer than if it was just you and George Floyd. You're going, you're going to have to use 100%. And it's not going to be safe for George, you or George Floyd. The officers continue to plead with him. Hey, man, just just take a seat. Get in the back of the SUV. Um, you know, like I said, then he starts to saying uh, he, he can't go. To, his, his COVID will come back if he gets into the back of the SUV and doesn't want to die. He's already pleading for his life and like in a weird way, way before there's any real physical uh, altercation. That's something that's weird that, that, that I just found to be real. I don't know. That just stood out to me. He says, uh, when I start breathing, it's going to go off in me. The ticking time bomb that's in his stomach right now. I think, <laughs> I, yeah, I think he knows that he's, that, uh, he swallowed a lot of drugs and, uh, and I'm, uh, he, he does say that. Starts yelling, I can't breathe again in the SUV. So here's, there's the cops open the other door to try to pull him to try to help get him in the vehicle and pull him through. And this is basically where, um, uh, where Chapman uh, shows up at. Yeah. So he wasn't even first on scene or second on scene. He shows up while he's been resisting, trying to get into this vehicle. That's when he finally shows up and he's trying to get, he opens the other door to, to pull him in. Very common practice. This is very common. Someone, Resisting arrest, not going in the car. Someone goes around the other side and pulls them in and shuts the door. And then he does this thing when he finally gets in and he wiggles his way Back almost immediately end. right out that right out of that other side. So and then they make the decision. They're like, you know what? Let's just pull him out. Pull him out. Because yeah, that's right. They decide is <laughs> he squirms all the way through and he asks to just put me on the ground. So ironically enough, that position, that, that famous position where he's, he's sitting on the ground, he asked to be there. He's the one who asked to be put on the ground. So that famous picture where it looks like he's thrown on the ground, and that's where he asked to be. So he asked to be put on the ground, and then that's when the call was made. You hear one officer say, hey, well, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's use the MRT. Well, they, they initially, when they made the right call, this is somebody said, let's call EMS. Within 37, 36 seconds of him being on the ground, someone says, let's call EMS. Yeah. And then, I think when he said MRE, he was talking about the MRT. The MRT, yeah. which is, uh, do you guys refer to that as well? Or do you know what MRT is? But before you looked into this, is that something that. No, went, went? I had no idea. But the MRT. Is called the maximum restraint technique that's utilized, well, never utilized by the <laughs> Minneapolis PD, but it was, uh, it was in their training manual that Derek Chauvin had. His, uh, I don't know if you want to get into that now. 
Yeah, we can get into it now. Yeah. yeah. So the maximum restraint technique is exactly what Derek Chauvin did, and there's a picture on his training manual. Yeah, we'll show it on the we'll show yeah. it on, on on the podcast. And it's it's literally mirror image of Derek Chauvin's infamous picture. The angle that was of the video looks like Derek Chauvin's on his neck. However. Again, not going to jump too far into this, but the BWCs, if they had been released, would show much different. Derek Chauvin was using the maximum restraint technique that was taught to him and provided in the manual that was issued to him. And it's identical. The illustration of instruction is what he did. Absolutely. In fact, there's. I would go as far as to say he's gone through that. Well, they they show it. He's been through that that training of MRT several times. It's, it looks to be almost an annual training. Yep. Um, not only does he have the because his mom comes out and shows the manual with the picture that depicts um, where to place one knee and the other knee, and there's even a still frame of what looks like a video, like a so one is like an illustrated picture, it was a PowerPoint that the, they watched, and that's right? And the other one's a PowerPoint of a picture of a police officer doing exactly what the illustration shows, which is exactly what, uh, what Derek did. So it's, it, it blows my mind. He, he actually did exactly what the Minneapolis police department told him to do. And now if I'm not mistaken in the timeline is where you start, you should be questioning the dispatcher and again, like we talked about before, I'm not trying to say his death belongs in anybody's hands, but if you were to start painting hands red, right, you'd have to start painting other hands other than Derek's. So the the the, the first set of hands to paint red is George Floyd himself. <laughs> I hate to say it. It's not just me. Like it's you're so sucking up the cops. I'm but, not but, even conditioned but, to think yeah, that way anymore. Yeah, so the first set of hands that that it's on is is him, uh, and it's not getting like I said, it's not just me sucking up the cops. Um, cops are so f they're not even on this list. When we're done with this, you will see that cops aren't even on this list. The second one would be within thirty seven within thirty six seconds. They they call for EMS. It takes the ambulance twenty minutes to get there and this is where i'm just not sure where the uh where the blame lies uh there was a fire department uh i believe seven or eight blocks away from this incident not imagine they should be the first one uh on scene it would even if even if they don't have the absolute capabilities to deal with it they should still be going there if let's say the ones that need to go are another quarter mile down the road you know Letting right. letting one right. house sit there. Right. We're in a big city. Yeah. We're in Minneapolis and in Orlando. How long do you do you think? It, and what uh, code three? And they call and they call it in as a code three, correct? Yeah. And what does code three mean? Priority. Priority. Come here. That's license sirens. That's right. The, the blues and twos, as the Brits like to call it, and the wailing sirens and lights going off. Get here quick. How long does it take you when you when you ask for an ambulance code three to get there on scene? Usually. And well, it'll depend on where you yeah, are, where they are. Within minutes. Within minutes. So, but here's the thing is that I'm not going to speak. I'm going to give my opinion and this isn't true. I, uh, I believe it to be true, but there's no proof of this. And any firefighter or medic would absolutely say it's not true because they need to. But when I call in and go, I have a guy, um, he's, he's, we're requesting fire or medical for a, an arrestee that's complaining of chest pains. Technically that is a priority three call. That is a highest priority call. However, this is your seventh arrestee of your shift as a firefighter that you're having to get up maybe in the middle of the night and go tend to because they don't want to go to jail. And we've talked about this before. It's the same exact thing on paper as if a child wasn't breathing or a crackhead complaining of chest pains. It's the yeah. same thing on paper. Yeah. Are they going to go the same energy? Are they going to go with the same effort and the right. same, you know, mental status? Yeah. I would say probably not. Well, there's something in the description of the call between the, uh, um, and, and this, you know, in this chain of communication 
where the, the the paramedics arrive on scene or get get lost, yeah, and they don't even know really where where, where it's happening, and that that delays it as as and, well. And if you see it, there. they're walking around looking. Now, again, I don't, I do believe in staying calm when you're a first responder. That's very paramount. But if you were dispatched to a two year old not breathing, and you couldn't find him, you're there's going to be some oomph in your step to figure yeah. out where this two-year-old is. You can see him on the body-worn cameras of the of the cops. Yeah. They're just walking around. They're trying. They're not, it's not like they're not trying, but they're they're just walking and going, where are these guys? Because so it's a routine call. And, and this is a, a good point to, to, to get there and start talking about the, the knee on his neck, the infamous picture that everyone thinks of when they think of this incident. And here's what's crazy to me, and really this particular thing changed my whole point of view on this when you see that picture online that distance and that or i should say more that angle and then him on that dark shirt with the dark color pants that the police officer is wearing it looks like it's right on his neck but when you actually watch the the body worn camera footage of it and this even gets brought up in case or in court and even in court the people on the stand all gave gave this as well looking at the body warm cam where does it look like his knee is and the answer to the people on the stand is on his shoulder blade not on his neck on his shoulder blade now i'm not saying during this uh you know during this and and these these according to to, to politicians this uh, and, and news reporters, I hear everything from five minutes to seven minutes to eight minutes to nine minutes. So they can't even Maybe get the story just right. just making shit up at that point. Maybe his knee had slipped to his neck for a split second, but but I can assure you, and we'll show you through the reports of how we know it wasn't on his neck. Well, one one reason I know it's on his neck, especially during during the body worn camera, and, or even from from the film where he starts screaming for or not screaming, but he's definitely calling out for his mom. And it's heartbreaking to hear a guy on the ground calling out for his mom when you know how that ends. But he's he he goes, "Mom, mama. <sighs> mama." <sighs> and you could hear him inhaling easily and then screaming for mama, screaming for mama. You can hear him say, "I can't breathe" while he's clearly breathing. Yeah. It's I mean, kind of crazy. And some things to uh we are going to talk about the court case, but from what's going on in this and right now in this storyline or in this timeline is that there's two things that are not being that are not going to be allowed to be used in court. One of them is the illustrations and the PowerPoint of the maximum restraint technique that are clear indicators of why Chauvin did what he did. Um, they're not allowed to be used in court per the judge. The judge decided that they can't be used. The second thing is body worn camera of a cop sitting shotgun in the ambo. Uh, I don't know why I was in there. Maybe he was going with to the hospital with uh, George Floyd, but it has the driver of the ambulance. I'm assuming some kind of medic or a paramedic or firefighter was telling him like, yeah, we botched this. We, we couldn't right. find you guys. Yeah, right. You know, it was yeah, essentially that. saying it was our fault that yeah. we, it took 20 minutes to get there. That was not allowed to be used in court. It's an, uh, and I'll, I'll get this here in a second. I just want, I want to finish the, uh, uh, I guess the the street scene um, of of where he, he eventually goes uh, limp and then gets put into the the ambulance. There's one particular Karen on this scene that drives me. You already know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm gonna call her out by name. Genevieve Hansen. She's sitting there harassing the police officers. She starts, she has her phone out and she, and if you didn't know any better, you just thought she would just be another part of this angry mob, anti-police yeah. officer person. Well, you, you watch them, you know, who is she? She is a Minneapolis firefighter did, off duty. Did, did she call 911? No, in fact, she, she utilized her phone. Want to know what she utilized it for? The one for calling nine one one. It was to film yeah. social injustice. You think, you think she has some uh, medical training? Yeah, well, the the problem is instead of in, instead, it, it's hard because as a cop, I I probably would have told her no because I don't. I mean, unless you had your credentials on you, maybe. But you know, jump in and go. Can I help? I'm a firefighter. I'm off duty. But you know, I, let me let me help you guys until they get here. Didn't offer that. Nope. So you can't. You know, I can't say what the cops would have said had she 
address them normally, not as a heckling bystander, but yep. like, but as a, a bystander that truly cares, Hey, I'm a firefighter. I have uh, a medical background. I can, I can help save. I, there's some things. Can, can I help? I believe, I believe they would have said yes, but we'll never know. Cause the only thing she used their phone for was to record them and harass them. Well, and they were able, well, they were able to prove it. It didn't matter in court, but they proved it to anybody with a fucking level head. Oh, sorry. Is that, um, you know, they were like, it was kind of absurd the amount of time it took them to get there. And she's like, yeah, he goes, but you didn't call showing that even to her, he did not look like he was dying. Or being killed. You already mentioned it. Um, I don't want to get into the court just yet, but we we were talking about body-worn camera. Why do you think it took two and a half months for them to release the body-worn camera, which is way too late for for all for for the for the riots and everything? Well, most most departments have a very very liberal uh, transparency policy, which is we're going to get you the body-worn cameras within. X amount of time. Seems, I mean, within right. 24 hours is some, you know, critical right. incidents. You, you, the public I mean, and that's the new, transparency. Yeah. Um, this is the only thing that I can th- take away is that it was an election year and it was going to be weaponized. And um, they were like, yeah, well, I mean, we'll get them the body worn cameras, but let's, let's get our narrative out there and start pushing this first. Uh, uh, which, to I be can't. fair, I think a week into this, I think a week into this, if they could have a time machine, they would have gone back and never done anything. But they had to, they had to go with what they had, and somehow the mob ruled. So I'm, I'm going to lay this out this this timeline. We're going to hop into the the autopsy report uh, now, which is critical. Um, and the timeline is this: George Floyd dies May 25th, 2020. The autopsy report is released within 12 hours. Within 12 hours, we have an autopsy report out that's gonna that would clearly go ahead and say, mm, "There's more to this story." Um, the now the toxicology report, which goes into even more in depth, doesn't get released until May 31st. But it doesn't matter. By May 27th, 12 hours later, we have a very good indicator of what happened that actually lines up with with good police work. And the third precinct gets burned to the ground and riots, uncontrollable riots happen immediately all the way through May 28th. So they had the truth on their side and they could have pushed back against the narrative and say, hold on, we have scientific evidence that maybe what you think happened isn't what happened. And besides releasing the body worn cameras immediately, they didn't give any pushback knowing what they knew through the autopsy report. Let me tell you what that says. Autopsy report conducted by Dr. Andrew Baker. Um, he met with prosecutors and the FBI within within 24 hours. He's That's another thing. Them. Why is the FBI That's- involved in this? A high profile case, maybe. I, I don't know. You might not that know the answer quick, to that. Within twenty four, yeah. I mean, and it must have gotten traction that fast, uh, that quick that the FBI is like, "Whoa, oh, I guess we gotta." But again, I don't. I guess if I keep on saying I'm not a conspiracy, maybe I am. Um, but we're gonna, the, we're gonna turn you. But but if but if the FBI is here in twenty four hours, who sent them? Yep, the the feds did. Mm-hmm. Which Department of Justice? Department of Justice. I think there's some pressure from 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 the White House to hey, let's. Let's let's yeah. let, let's let's get ahead of this. It seems seems to be who always seems to benefit off of off of off of race baiting. Liberal politicians. One side of the aisle seems, seems to. <laughs> and so here they are within twenty four hours talking to the feds. And it says May twenty six findings. No evidence of asphyxiation. There is no bruising on his neck. There is no crushed airway. There is absolutely no indication that a knee on his neck is what killed him. George Floyd had a pre-existing condition, which which is noted with uh, in in the report. Um, he has a coronary artery disease. One of his arteries is blocked by seventy five percent. So uh, yeah, God, when I hear that, that it just goes back to that to that that to that. <laughs> Angel on the street telling him you're going to give yourself a heart attack. Yeah. Um, 
the May 27th. This is still a day before the third precinct riot gets uh, third precinct um, gets burned down by a riot. The very next day, they meet again, and Doctor Baker goes a little bit further into his findings, and he says this: his his diagnosis is multifactorial. And he, and he lists his three main reasons of why he believes um, George Floyd died, according to his body. One, coronary artery disease is why, is why he thinks his heart gave out on him. Again, we don't have the toxology report yet, although he's, he's absolutely right. It had something to do with his heart. Two, potential stimulants in George Floyd's system, adding stress to a weak heart. So... He believes somehow d- during this autopsy that there's potential. Well, then let me tell you why there's potential stimulants involved and why we already know that. They, they found drugs, uh, both met- methamphetamines and fentanyl, in his car. And they also found it in the back of the SUV covered with his saliva, which meant some of the stuff he was still storing in his mouth that he hasn't swallowed yet. He tried to spit on the floorboard, it's, which is why he rolled over onto yeah, the floorboard. A lot of those guys, they cannot swallow. They have such bad dry mouth that they cannot swallow the drugs. And the, it, you think you're like, why do you keep it in your mouth? They're trying to swallow it. They just can't. And now they're under pressure. They're under stress. They can't breathe, I guess. Then the last one, <laughs> three said, you know, the, uh, um, the, uh, the the added the added stress to his body uh, caused by an encounter with the, the with you know struggling with the police department, which was basically means I don't I don't know if he was hooping that day, like you said. I don't know if he was if his heart is capable of hooping and of hooping. And, and, and and taking that type of uh, of 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 raised blood pressure and raised heart heart rate. Um. That is May twenty seventh. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and hop ahead. This guy walks around with He's a, a ticking time bomb. He he walks around with a blood pressure that would kill a normal man. That's his walking blood pressure. Gosh, <laughs> I'm um I want to keep this fairly chronological, which is but I will uh jump ahead to May thirty first and the toxology report again only because what I wanna what I want to say is had they had they pushed back because of body-worn cameras that they had, which would have proven he was on his neck. If they'd have pushed back on the May 26th and May 27th autopsy reports, which would have corroborated what the, you know, what the, what the body-worn cameras were already telling you, they'd have had a solid case to say, hey, Minneapolis, settle down. Mm-hmm. Maybe this isn't the person you're looking for. But it, look, it seems like they're always, they already have their mind made up. Police are bad. They're hunting us, and they're looking for someone to finally fit that narrative that they're that they're hoping for. And I feel like they're trying to force this guy to be that guy. Yeah. This and this isn't your guy. No, this isn't they, your guy. No, they 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 put all their eggs in the wrong basket. And it's a toxicology report: uh, methamphetamines, nineteen nineteen ngml or nanograms per milliliter. Um, uh, fentanyl. Fentanyl is described as high levels of fentanyl, um, which was 11, is what came out. 11 uh, nanograms per milliliter. Did you know as low as 3 is considered uh, toxic enough to kill a person? Almost 4 times in the, the amount of system that can kill a man. His lungs, his lungs weighed 2 to 3 times the normal weight. Of mm. of a pair of lungs, um, it's just it's it's insane that that d- d- again if we just and if we just said hey we have some things let's wait and then just a few days later they'd have known exactly what killed them. Well, and all, while they're doing all this, the reason why I feel like they're they're doubling down on their decision to use Chauvin as the the bad cop of the you know the century is because these riots are starting as we're going through this timeline, these protests turned riots are already starting. There's day one and there's day two. And then there's day three, which is what we're going to go into. But I feel like they're just trying to perpetuate this and liberal government. When I say, I don't mean libertarian, I mean like the left, they need lower income 
neighborhoods as their constituents. They, they won't stay in power any other way. So they have to take, and it sucks. Sometimes they're less educated. Sometimes, um, you know, they from birth, they only know and understand one thing, whether it be police or bad, um, reliance on the government, whatever that be, they, 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 they don't have enough education, you know, look at their school systems to, to get them out of that, to think a little bit more freely for themselves. So, you know, it, do I really truly believe that politicians think educated politicians think the police are bad people? Absolutely not. They just know that they need these they need people that. to think that they're bad. They want to stay in power. It's a, it's, it is a power grab and it kills you that, that they can't recognize that. Um, we'll go into what, and if all that doesn't piss you off, the third precinct is probably what makes me the most upset. Whew, man, this it, is it, insane. Uh, the, the, sometimes we talk about parallels with the military and law enforcement. Um, you know, you can you can call it a base, like you were saying earlier. You could call it a base and think the same mindset, which those cops were. But um, this is a precinct. This is where you work every day. This is where you go into and then you deploy to the streets. Deploy might be a bad word, but essentially that's what it is. For 12 hours, you go and brief in this building. You deploy and you come back. And then a new shift is briefing to take over the streets. So, and one thing, you know. I, it, it goes without saying that the precinct was given up and it burned, but there's things about like precincts, like, you know, people spent parts of their career there. You bring your kids there, you know, to, to think like I brought my kid there and he got to see all these cool things and I had family there and it was just let, it was let go. Their backup 911 system is at the third precinct. There, yeah, you know, the, the the precinct itself has a museum there. A museum has a museum full of, of of artifacts and great things for generations that police officers have done to keep this city safe. It's to me, it's yeah, like I said, I, I look at it a little bit more through a military perspective, and I think this is this is my base, like, and you have to protect this, and yeah. and it'd be one thing, and again, I go back to all these. The, the the facts that we do have, it'd be one thing to give up the base and have to go. We kind of have to because we were wrong. Like like this, so this is kind of facing the music a little bit, and we're gonna have to let the guys get out of their system because we screwed this up. But that wasn't or, true. Or you have to retreat. I mean, I know again the one thing I would say that is a difference in the military and law enforcement is that I know for a fact no law enforcement leadership, good leadership, would do the Alamo. They would tell their guys <laughs> to true. back out. They would, but you know, and there's no point in senselessly. If you can get out of it, if, if your building's going to be overran, you know, it, just retreat. But that wasn't the case either. No. And there's a lot of things that we're going to talk about that are clear indicators that this was pre-planned. This was, this was going to happen. They were going to give up the precinct. Like earlier that day, staff had come in and taken all those museum artifacts and, everything valuable they started taking out and if you watch this documentary you get the vibe that a lot of the brass in that precinct lieutenants and stuff were kind of confused at what was going on you know maybe maybe the command maybe it hadn't been announced that they were going but no they were they were looking for guidance they they thought this whole time we have there's a plan coming down and they're asking them hey can can we use uh, you know, less than lethal. Can we use scat rounds? What's a scat round? But I don't know you, what okay. a scat round is, but I th maybe something like a beanbag round. They're uh, they're looking to see should we don riot equipment because it's getting very riot like out there. They were allowed helmets. That's they were it. allowed helmets. And here's the and crazy it. thing about civil unrest, riots, whatever you want to call them, is that if I am out on my regular patrol. Right. My regular job duties and someone and I'm going to I'm someone's detained by my authority and I'm going to arrest them or whatnot. And they go to the ground and they pick up a rock and they go like this. Sorry, man, if you're not listening to me, it is what it is. It, that's lethal force. If you're going to pick up an object that could hit me and incapacitate me, that's lethal force. No matter where you are, if you are holding a line. During a riot or a protest, 
and someone picks up something to throw at you. Now, I will say that a lot of admin does not allow and multiple organizations and departments does not condone bottles and rocks and glass being thrown at their officers. But you can, if you see somebody, if you're holding a line and you see yeah. some, one of the protesters pick up something to throw at you, yeah. you can't shoot them. That's not lethal yeah. force anymore. Right. It's almost accepted behavior. They, they've already sent th- the, from the stats that, that, uh, that I looked into uh, at least 30 officers home from, from injuries sustained from the people outside throwing uh, frozen water bottles, rocks, mortars, Molotov cocktails. I mean, they, I mean, they, this was, this is an act of terrorism Mm -hmm. is, is what this is. And when I look at, at everything that was happening and everything they were doing, and there's, there's videos out there of police officers crumbling when they get hit in the head. Cause not all of them have, did you see that one? Y'all it was the trash can lid breaks my heart, breaks my heart. And and I don't want to get overly political about this, but the only thing I could think of is when I look at all this, and I say, you want to call January 6th terrorists in an insurrection? There is nothing more terrorist-like than what they are doing right now to their own city. They are burning down their own city off of a lie. And do you think liberal politicians care that all these companies and all these uh, billion-dollar industries are now going to pull out of a city like this because it's not worth having property there. They don't care because they need them to be reliant on government. This is always, this is always my question. And I really don't, I, I don't understand riot and looting as, as, as an answer to, you know, to, to a problem. I don't understand. And these, this, this is a very small list of, uh, of, of the uh, businesses that got looted. What does T-Mobile and going in there and stealing cell phones have anything to do with this? How does this? How does this push your cause forward? Um, Foot Locker, going in and getting free shoes. How does this send a message to to the police department or to for change or to the politicians? Um, Chicago Lake Liquors. All that seems pretty selfish to me, and I feel like no it's one all- is ever going to stand up as a politician and say, "Hey." You have the right to assemble um, peacefully, but this, this is thuggery oh my, and, hey. and will not help your case. In fact, it'll do the opposite. But instead, they, they defend them like, well, we understand. They're mad. Yeah, the cops that were positioned to just be eyes on That's right. watched arson take place. Could have stopped it. They watched people pick up the Molotov cocktails. And they were told to stand down and just observe and report. So, and it almost, this sounds terrible, but it almost makes the p- burning a police pre- precinct down make sense. That's the only one. I know. Ironically <laughs> enough, it's the only one that makes yeah. sense. And, and then we'll go back to this. Like I view this as a base and something that you, especially when you have, when you have the moral high ground, which they did, who are the only people Generally speaking, and and you're and this is where our, our 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 work very much parallels. Who's the people who run? The cowards. Well, cowards. One thing. Do, oh, the people that do, were wrong. The people that were wrong. Do in, you ever you find innocent people running a, a whole lot? No, I mean, in, in, in any in any type of battle or war, the ones you know so, that end up retreating are the ones that. Or like, so when they tried, (laughs) not all of them were in vehicles. Some of them left in vehicles and the rest of them ran in formation, ran away from their precinct. It's because they were, they were, it's what they were told to do. Yeah. They ran away from their precinct as if they had something to hide. I'm just telling you, I don't want to, I'm not going to, well, yeah, I am. I am going to sit here and armchair quarterback this a little bit. What I expect them to do at least. Uh, sorry, last radio commi- uh, transmission coming a little broken. Uh, we'll we'll be here. Send send reinforcements, and you bunker up. You do not give up the base to that. And I and I and I'll stand by that statement. And that we're gonna, I'll, I'm sure I'll get a little bit of hate for that, and I don't care. It, well, it you, could, you you hold the fort. And it maybe not maybe not all of the blame to the boots on ground. Maybe some of the blame is to the 
the admin on ground, you know, the in-house admin, the lieutenants and captains that run that precinct could have said, we're not doing that. And, and, you know, this, <clears throat> and in their interviews, it, it, it kills them to this day. In their recent interviews, they talk about this a lot. I can't believe we gave it up. I can't believe, you know, we did this. I can't. Yeah. Then you had a decision and you left. So part of that blame is, is on you. You don't have to do everything the people above you say. Everyone yeah. has a choice. And I, I know that's a hard choice and, I, and I'm being a little judgmental and very like, you know, harsh on them, but that is, well, it is a fact. It's a, it's a fact. I mean, it's, it's not an opinion. It's a fact. And you know, the, one of your sayings is, is it was a decision. It's not, you know, <laughs> say decision. And, and I, we have our opinions on that decision, yeah. but I mean, and oh man, it just goes down to it. the, oldest tale of time is when do you turn in your badge when when do you say uh i'm gonna stick this night out and i know that i'm gonna be fired tomorrow but it's the right thing to do and and this is and this is a question i have for you uh and and you did both military and and, and current law enforcement is and i'm not giving a pass to the military when they don't do something right there i give no pass the yeah. right thing to do is always the right thing to do but when you're in the military I would, you don't have another military to go to. Mm-hmm. You're going to lose, you're going to lose everything. And this is, and, uh, and, and police work. And we, we've seen it and for the bad. Actually, we've seen it where someone gets fired from a police department because they should have been, and they go work for a, another, another police department, right, right up the road, which is yeah. kind of crazy. So, uh, and you let me know if this, if this statement is true, could they have done the right thing, got fired, and then just got picked up at another police department right down the road and not had anything to worry about? I think the biggest thing that people worry about in life is retirement. Um, they bank so much on, uh, man, I got to get this 20 years done. If I can get this 20 years done, I can go fish on my boat for the rest of the days. And you see cops hitting post 15 years, and that's all that's in their head. They are not going <laughs> to risk right. anything to fuck that up, um, which is maybe why some of the command made the decisions that they made, because it's just not, you know, I, I think that above captain and above, you're starting to worry about your political career. Um, but, you know, so even if they didn't fire you, like you're not major material, you're not major material, have fun retiring at captain, you yeah. know, and you know, that's it for you. Um, you know, and the fear of being fired sucks but to answer your question about reti- could you yes but i mean these guys after the night like night they're if they're gonna quit if they're if they're not gonna be employed by the minneapolis pd i don't think they're gonna go back to copper period and, and a lot of them didn't and you can absolutely say no we're not doing this be fired for insubordination yeah. and then go apply and another agency yeah. with different administration can look at that and go, Oh, you're our, you're our type of cop, Yeah, but you're starting over. Yeah. And th- they talk about this. They lost hundreds mm. uh, of cops to this. So I, so again, ironically enough, what they did to their own city because of a perceived lack of safety ends up only making their city much more dangerous. They're talking about, they had, you know, muster or roll cars, roll, roll calls that were in the 30 to 50 range before they go out on patrol that day. And they're saying after this, We'd have formations of two people to go to work that day, and, yeah. and, and in a particular sector, that's crazy. But I, but good Wait, on them. Why? Why would you stay? Why would you stay around? They went from eight hundred and like ninety something. They end. I think they lost at the end of the day after this incident. They lost three hundred and twelve officers because they're because we're about to get into the court case because what they're about to do to their own which is by following protocol and by assessing everything, making all the right calls, calling EMS within 36 seconds, using the MRT, which is absolutely what they taught these guys to do. What, why, why would you stick around? It's sad. It's so sad. And I think that's why people, when they thank law enforcement nowadays, it's not, I'm thanking you for protecting me. It's I'm thanking you for going through this shit because I know, I know that, I need you out here and I know that you're not protected when you're protecting me. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of the appreciation that spills out because it, it's a lot it, appreciation for law enforcement, although soft and quiet, 
is in the majority. And we talk about that all the time, but it's the people that matter, like the mob and the politicians That's and the right. police admin that make the calls. Yeah. 98% of society would uh, want them to hold that precinct. Right. And we say this is a good segue. When we say the the mob is making the calls. The mob made the calls in this in this court case. Let's talk about that. Meanwhile, this has had a year to brew. This is a year later, March twenty twenty one. I think is when they have had court hearings, but the trial started a year later. The jury selection, and it's just had a year to just fester. Yeah, and I mean, so the jury selection was this is any start of a trial is you have to pick your jury which were openly asked do you support black lives matter and i'm going to be the first one to tell you if you don't know but i think all of our listeners know black lives matter is a domestic terrorist organization that is anti-law enforcement it has nothing to do with the black community and brings nothing of benefit to the black community. It's been proven. Yeah. And so these yeah. jurors and we're going to do a bot. We're going to let you know. Now we're going to do a podcast on black lives yeah. matter. So everyone knows exactly what we mean when we say that. Um, these jurors were asked that they said m- overwhelmingly support black lives matter. Um, so this is the jury selection. Um, first off. Well, okay. That's the jury selection. The, the issues with the jury is that this is such a – Derek Chauvin was not able to get a fair trial no matter what. And I really don't think unless you went to like a remote location somewhere in the country that didn't – that was like way behind the times, like somewhere like – no offense to anybody, but like Kentucky – like, or, or, you know, like West Virginia, there's parts in there that are, you know, 20, 30 years behind and they don't really fall. He was not going to be able to get a fair trial. So that being said, that sucks, but this is the first trial of its caliber in recent times. So, um, you know, the jury, the defense, Derek Chauvin's defense was adamant. We have to stop the jury from getting all of this updating reoccurring news information. That's not true. None of it's true, but they're getting fed it. And the judge, there's a clip of him going on record saying, well, I told him not to watch the news, a jury of, of a case of this caliber. The jury has to be sequestered, which means I'm sorry, you're going to be held up in a hotel. And by the way, when people that the people that are end up being selected out of hundreds of people, they are the ones that want to be there so that you're not imprisoning these people in a hotel room. They <laughs> right. want to be there for the right reasons. I'm, I'm saying like they, they believe in the process and that's awesome. That's the jury you want. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't know if this happened in the, I'm assuming it probably, this should have been taken way far away from the city. That's it. That's exactly what I was thinking. Cause there's no, there's no way that you get a, impartial jury of your peers within the city there's no way yeah so they should have been sequestered they should have had no tvs and unfortunately no cell phones a lot of today's um juries they're told by law you cannot do this but when they go home what do you think they do and and there's so um, i got i got questions about judge cahill Mm -hmm. um why why do you think so? They they didn't allow the the body worn camera. And, I, th- and, I think they allowed the body worn camera. If I'm not mistaken, no, no, it, no, they did. They didn't allow certain certain body worn camera footage, and I'm sure they had some kind of legal jargon, like the 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 medic saying we botched this. Essentially, the medic taking the blame for taking 20 minutes to get there. That wasn't allowed in. And um, the pictures of the maximum restraint technique that was in the manual and the right. PowerPoint were not yep. allowed in there. Yeah, oh. I already already talked about how they they use the body worn the parts of the body worn camera to ask you know people on the stand, hey, does this knee look like mm-hmm. it's on his neck mm-hmm. or on his shoulder? So parts of it were, not all of it was admitted. And what's crazier, you already mentioned it. The MRT was not was not admitted. Those those. Diagram those uh, PowerPoint presentations and diagrams of the book were not admitted. That's crazy. And the chief, when they asked the chief of police, "Is this is this a, a technique that is a uh, you know allowed by by the uh, by MPD?" He sat there, hand on the Bible, and said, "No." Not only the chief, all of his administration lied. 
He lied on the stand and all of his department knew he lied. They knew he lied. So what do you do when you lead 800 men and you lie on the stand and you know, they know, you know, they know that right. you're lying and you don't care and you lie. What's that do to morale? This goes back to transparency. We talk about everything they, that they did wrong uh, as far as giving no pushback. And now even on the stand, you're the people who are supposed to have your back. Your, your, your supervisors are telling already a very partial jury, uh, jury. By the way, what what he did? No, we that's that's not that's not something we've ever taught. That's crazy to me. And the judge also before we leave the judge, he spent I think it was 10 years in the same office as the prosecutors that were prosecuting Derek Chauvin. That's right. Some little good old the, boy system yeah, stuff little, in little there. Yeah, little good old boy system there. The the whole system's a good old boy system. I'm a I'll end up talking about who, who this system is and here in a second. And it's, it's sad that a judge is supposed to be, and I've seen them and I met them. Um, you know, they are, it's like people say about cops, the overwhelmingly, the overwhelming majority of police officers are good people trying to go out there and do the Lord's work. 99.9% .9 of them. The same thing, in my opinion, goes with judges. Some of them might lean liberal, of course, but at the end of the day, they take an oath to do what's right, to have a fair trial. And if you look at everything about this judge, it, he had an agenda and he had glasses of whiskey and cigars with higher people than him about this. Well, let's let's talk about the charges themselves. Since I'm not a police officer, I had to look this up to know exactly, you know, what, what, what I mean, the, of course, the charges matter. The charges brought up was second degree murder. So I don't know all the degrees, so I'd look it up. Second degree murder still intent is 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 still intent. You have to prove intent. So that was a very I I thought as soon as I when because I, I saw the the charge first, and the first thing I thought was I can't believe they that that he got convicted over this because they they stretched on a second degree murder, which means uh, it's not premeditated, but you without a doubt intentionally killed this man. Yeah. So the. Is, uh, most states have this uh, first degree murder is premeditated murder. I'm going to wait for some Brent to walk out in the parking lot tonight and I'm going to kill him. Brent's child's in there. That's kind of fucking dark, but essentially <laughs> that's what, it, that's what it is. And, 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 the, and you have to prove that they had a plan and they executed that plan. Second degree murder is it happens, right? The situation happens, but right. there's still intent. There's a struggle in this room right. and I pulled out a gun and killed you. Still intent, second degree right. murder. I didn't plan it. And then there's always third degree or there's always the next level, which is like a manslaughter type charge, which is. And, I, I, and manslaughter is what I thought was that at the most yeah. that, that, that they get away with. And of course the charges matter because, you know, the higher the charge, the longer the sentence. Yeah. Um, and that blows my mind. Well, and also, I, also the state, they, when usually when they have, when they want to try for second degree murder, but they know they're not going to get it, they'll charge manslaughter so they can get something. They want to win. They're not going to stretch a second degree murder charge on something like this because it's ridiculous. And no f functioning state attorney's office that has no ill intent is going to look at this and go, we got second degree murder. They're going to go, oh, we may have manslaughter so, may so the only way you get that charge across is by having a judge that keeps out certain things to be presented or no one facts checks a uh, chief of police that lies on the stand that's the only way you get that charge otherwise you have to prove that that Derek was sitting there during the arrest process thinking in his mind I'm going to kill this man. I want to kill this man. Yeah. What I'm going what I'm doing right now is going to kill this man and I don't care. There's there's no way. There's no way you would think that happens except what do you already say about you know who like, politicians sway things and so the mob the mob 100% along with politicians swayed this and there was no there was this is there was no other outcome to this other than appeasing the mob and this and this innocent police officer who just did his job and did his job textbook by the way he's described all his peers as a textbook police mm -hmm. officer a by the book police officer which is ironic because he did exactly what you showed him he to do. did it by the book 
<laughs> he did. The, uh, he literally did the illustration on the book. So Derek Chauvin's still in jail. <coughs> he gets he gets convicted, uh, serving fifteen years, I believe, fifteen or sixteen mm-hmm. years. And that wasn't enough. Not only did they go after him, they went after the other three cops on scene: a black man, a Chinese man, and another uh, white man as accomplices to murder. And they are all serving between three and five years of a sentence. I want to talk about them, but real quick about the jurors too. <clears throat> um, the amount of pressure that were on these jurors. So first off, they had the National Guard out there ready for civil unrest. This was a lot like um a lot like the Rodney King trials. Um they were prepared for a not guilty verdict and they were prepared for rioting. Um these jurors knew that. These jurors had that on their head that if like man, if I do the right thing and I say cuz it only takes one juror, it only takes one person to go, I'm not buying this and it's a hung jury and they can go and retry it again which they probably would have until they got their conviction. But, you know, that, that juror now has to worry about death threats, you know, being, being physically harmed, you know, so, or just, they don't want the burden of the city burning down on their head. So the mob mentality reached the jury room. And of course it reached the jury room because at the end of the day, they were not sequestered. They absolutely knew what was going on outside. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in real time, including the civil trial, which ended during during this time as well, where the family got twenty seven million dollars for raising a thug, a lifelong thug who did nothing but crime, resist the police, took drugs, swallowed drugs, killed himself with an overdose. And then got $27 million for it. And on top of that, civil trials usually happen after the criminal case for many reasons. However, one of the reasons is the the way it looks to the jury, right? So if the jury's sitting there and it, it can sway a jury, if the jury's sitting there and they go, okay, well... That family just got paid out $27 million. That's a large sum of money. That, at the time, was the largest sum of money paid for an instance like this ever in the history of the United States. It looks like, holy shit, they wouldn't pay $27 million unless... They anything wrong. Yeah. So, uh, so the jury, and I feel like they, they knew this, and I feel like I'm sure, I'm sure some of them is, uh, had didn't have a problem at all of sending this guy who did nothing wrong to jail for 15 years. But some tells me some of them did. They deliberated for 10 hours. Yeah, that is a long time. Usually yeah. a slam dunk case is 45 yeah. minutes. That's right. A slam dunk case is, is, with, is within the hour. Sometimes it takes days. They didn't go days, but 10 hours? They, it's, it's fair to say they thought about this long and hard, but still came to the conclusion of mob rule. Derek Chauvin, I think he had 19 years on, on the job. 17... T- 1819 somewhere up there he had a lot of he had a lot of uh well don't quote me because i don't have that statistic, but he had a lot of years on he got 22.5 years in prison gosh alex how do you say his last name kyung yeah actually i, I when i i think they they pronounce it king king okay yeah. alex king the black cop yep uh third shift on as an officer third, <laughs> third shift shift 3.5 years in prison yeah, i knew he was i knew he was, he was newer on the job but that's Thomas Lane, fourth shift as an officer. So these, I'm assuming these two were uh, F- in FTO with these other officers. Fourth mm. shift on as an officer, three years in prison. Yeah, I'm going to butcher this name. Tuto? Yeah. Tuto? Say with uh, confidence. Yeah. <laughs> Tuto, the Asian cop, nine years of service, 4.75 years in prison. But it just kills me. If you're a young cop, you just got on the job. And there's no, I'm not, I'm not saying there's an excuse, but holy shit, accomplice to murder, third shift on the job. I'm telling you right now, my third shift on the job, you're not doing anything. You're observing. Yeah. You're just, you're observing and you're, you're doing what you're being told to do. Yeah. There should be no, but this is, rough. this one really got my blood boiling. I, I actually didn't think, uh, that. Again, everything that I found out about this was even still uh, in, 
my initial reaction where where I thought Derek Chauvin had had done some things wrong, uh, I found out that he did nothing wrong. Um, and when you added everything to this, uh, it just I, I I cannot believe we've done this to our law enforcement, our good law enforcement in America. This was not the people you were looking for. This was not the case you were that yep. you were looking for. These were good men who actually did everything right and a good job and are sitting in prison right now for it. And if and if all of our tens of thousands of listeners aren't more upset about that after listening to this, uh, well, and I know you will be, uh, what are we supposed to do? do? Are we supposed to, to, to riot and start burning buildings yeah. in order to get our way? We're, we're not going to do that. So these guys just have to sit in prison quietly again, while the silent majority, the good people of this America have, have can't, can do nothing about it. So we talked about the mob politics, all these people that are going to benefit from, from, doubling down on this and they came out on top peter cahill cahill Cahill, the judge the judge of this case he remained a judge in the county keith ellison well, let, let me go down the let me go down the list okay. of 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 the players so you, you just mentioned uh judge cahill yeah cahill uh I'm, I'm i'm gonna start from from the top this although she wasn't directly involved but had plenty to say about it this Minneapolis is the same people who gave us Elon, uh, 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 representative Omar. <laughs> yeah. She represents this district. The same Congresswoman who married her brother to become a citizen and, uh, and get her power. Governor Tim Waltz, Democrat. Um, he said, this is time to show, um, respect and dignity to those suffering in our com- in our community, respect and dignity to someone who has a a laundry list of of uh, of a rap sheet that he has who committed armed robbery. Yeah, we'll see. To, these are to, violent felonies. These are not these are not just victim right. drug who, charges. Who he would have known, or would have if he wasn't briefed, he could have easily been involved in this and said, "Hey, let me you know tell me what's going on. I want an, I want an update on this." He should have known, if he didn't know, shame on him, that the by this time that he's making these remarks, the uh, toxology report is without a doubt um, out. He also said this made us look at a reality that was always there. This is what your governor is saying about your police department, the, the MPD, that this it's always been there. They've always been these bad guys. Again, this isn't the case that, that you wanted. Mayor Jacob Fry, um, there's there's only one thing that you that you need to know about him, uh, the Democratic mayor of Minneapolis, who got reelected, by the way. Google um, Dan- Jacob Fry dancing Juneteenth, and you will see a ridiculous mayor dancing the jig, celebrating Juneteenth. Uh, I also because I'm trying to be fair. I tried to see if he was if he ever danced for July Fourth. No, no, no results. Okay, no results. Yielding um, negative results. <laughs> um, the governor, to back up real quick, also asked. He called for swift justice of the police officers, and this is before the trial. You have the governor asking for swift justice. The highest man in the state. The highest of the police officers. He didn't ask for swift justice and let the court system yeah. let us know what really happened. He called for the police officers to to be found guilty. Um, attorney Crump, who was the uh, prosecu- uh, prosecuting attorney, he has made millions and millions and oh, the prosecuting attorney in the civil case, millions and millions and millions of dollars off of social justice. So you don't think he comes in having having an agenda? It's worked out really well for him um keith ellison is who you're referring to he is the attorney general for the state of minnesota tell you the type of person he is um he has he was the one who brought on the second degree murder murder charges it it, it goes through his office and he's Mm -hmm. the one who who wanted that um he also has a long history of defending gang members even defending gang members who have killed cops 
That's who Keith, Keith Ellison is. Well, you know, Keith Ellison was able, after this incident, he was able to write a book about how he helped break the wheel of police violence. Which, again, as we've now told you over the last hour plus, there was no police violence and in, in this. Um, they did everything right and by the book. So when you ask yourself, how does this come about? And the num the number one perpetrator of this, to you know, to me, it sound like a, you want to talk about a, a broken broken wheel. The media, the media ran with this with no facts and no wanting well, to know the, the truth. Number one perpetrator. Complete bias reporting. It was George Floyd. He's a number one. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> So you have, you have the media finding, again, they were looking for this, and they found what they thought was mm -hmm. this person put on a pedestal, did, did, no, did no investigating, no journalism whatsoever. They are just, a, they put these good men behind bars as much as anyone else. The governor put these good men behind bars with his words and his sway. The mayor did. The congresswoman did. The attorney general did. It. If you live in Minneapolis, leave. Yeah. The leave. Ma Matthew Frank. It's, it's, it's done. It's gone. The head prosecutor for <clears throat> the city was appointed as a judge by Governor Waltz after this incident. Now he is a judge. So you thought Cahill was a bad judge. Yeah. Wait till this guy yep. gets his robe. So you think it's going to get better? It's it is it is only going to get worse. The only place the only the only option the citizens have for it to get better is to move. Um, but this uh, the mayor Jacob Frey, you can go look at the statistics, and he's out there celebrating that uh, that um, violence is down in in his city. That's absolutely not true. Go That's look at the stats between. Um, let me let me pull up these stats for you, Brent. Yeah. Please do. The 2020 stats are, are fairly stomachable, although I don't think you it, one one murder in your city is too much. Pull these stats. Minneapolis. Carjackings. 2019, 101. 2020, 388. 2021 during this trial, 655. And then in 2022... It did go down to 524. That's However, right. that's 423 right. more than 2019. That's right. And he's celebrating that as a win. Yeah. Gunshot wound victims, city of Minneapolis, 2019, 266. 2020, 551. 2021, 658. And then again, in 2022, it drops down to 544. Still. What a win. Still 200 more than 2019. You, you think, I, and I, I, I'm, I, I've, I've been a cop long enough to know how these programs work, and I know they're skewed. And yeah. there's no way that these are dropping. So, homicides, city of Minneapolis. Turn left onto West State Shut up, Siri. <laughs> and we'll cut that and come right back to it. <laughs> like five more minutes, boy. And we're back. 2019, 48 homicides. 2020. 84 homicides, Double. 2021, nine, 93 homicides, and then in 2022, 81 homicides. So I feel like by bringing it down a cunt here yeah. in 2022, he thinks that's a win. All those stats are doubled before, before they 2019, did this, before yeah. in, in 2019. So by trying to make this city safer, the problem is, and this is the whole problem with the BLM movement, This when you don't do it for the right reasons, when you look at a situation, you say, and you misdiagnose the problem, and if you misdiagnose the problem, you will sure as hell misdiagnose the solution. This is what you get. Keep keep voting the way you vote, Minneapolis, because this this is what you get. Yeah, and you don't think them losing three hundred police, uh, three hundred plus police officers had an effect on the safety of their city because you drug good officers through the mud. We just showed you it did. And this is happening all over the world or all over the U.S. I mean, look at Pittsburgh. They had their infamous viral moment when they pretty much said, uh, from, what, from the hours of three in the morning to fucking six, we're not coming. Yeah, we're not coming. <laughs> why would you? Why would you? They look just, look they, at this. They can't staff. <laughs> they can't staff it. Well, and just uh, before I forget, going back to, there's an infamous line. I, I wrote it down, but I forgot it. Um, 
that the uh, medical examiner, because the medical examiner, we all oh, forgot this very huge fact. The medical examiner came back with the stats that we read. Um, the family decided to have a private autism done. Autism. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> a private autopsy done, uh, which indicated pretty much that everything that their narrative needed it is um then so, so you're telling me if you pay a doctor enough money he'll tell you what what you want to hear two doctors two doctors went on record and saying everything matched the narrative and and when the unbiased doctor from from the government yeah. came out with the, well, you can't believe his he was approached and about what his findings and he said i think what he asked what's going to happen when these medical findings don't meet the public narrative. And he goes, this is the type of case that ruins careers. Yeah. And he, and he's right because the careers of all these people, you try being a wrench in this, 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 this yeah. go against this cog. Oh man. Sure. And you're yeah. going to get shot out quick and yeah. they're going to bring in somebody. And I know government work and you know, government work. There's always somebody willing to go, I'll do whatever you that say. I want to be here. Too many yes men <laughs> in the system. And that's the problem. And we rail against it all the time. Well, I, I hope you guys uh, are driving around listening to this as angry as I'm about to drive home because it's 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 resurfaced everything and I, I, it makes my blood boil. Yeah, it, and it it's one of those things where you know you could ask me right now, Tyler, do you feel Derek Chauvin was wrongfully in prison? And as an active law enforcement officer, I'm going to say I'm not going to give my opinion on that. That's how that's how politically driven this case is. You will not hear a cop. Outside of a non-recorded cigar bar over a thing of whiskey. Other than that, you will not hear a cop say anything other than what the narrative says. So I'll, I'll leave with this. If you, if you guys you know, appreciate the truth and, 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 uh, and actually uh, it's, it's nice to hear someone that will come out and actually dig into this and go against the grain. And even as unpopular as it is to tell the truth, and it doesn't matter if it's against, um, we'll we'll call like we say it against police officers if if they do it. We'll we clearly will call like we see it against uh, our own military if they're lying for fame and money and clicks. Um, if you guys appreciate the the work we do, please please support us. Please continue to watch. Uh, you know, tell your friends about us because we, we, we can't do this without you. We got a lot more of, uh, of this in, in the hopper as well. Yeah. And we we'll, we can do an episode about autism too. <laughs> <laughs> episode of autism coming soon. We'll do BLM first. Uh, we'll, we'll put in the priorities. We'll put it in there since you mentioned yeah. it. You can just probably just watch any episode and get, <laughs> and get <laughs> autism out of it. <laughs>